What I think I'll go ahead and do first is kind of tell you all a little bit how we try to do this program. Um, it is very discussion based. You will hear all of us interrupt in the middle. If we come up with something that we think is a decent idea, we'll interrupt. Uh, please, if you have a question, do not hesitate to just cut me off where I'm talking and we'll keep going. Same with anybody who's speaking here today. Uh, this is more coffee shop style. It's supposed to be talking, conversing, answering your questions. The plan is to go till about 10 o'clock. Sometimes we get some really good discussion. We go a little bit farther. So if for some reason you need to go feed cows, Kent was saying he thinks there's quite a few people doing that this morning. If you need to go do something like that, uh, feel free just to excuse yourself and walk right out the door if you need to. Um, but I'll go ahead and start it. Uh, Sarah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw you under the bus first. Do you want to go ahead and give us a little bit of an update on what's happening in Grant County? And then if they don't know you, I, I'm walking in, they seem to know you. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Like I know several of y'all just from previous work in the county, but I'm Sarah Donahue. I, uh, just a little background on me. I've got an animal science degree from Texas Tech University. And my husband and I have a cow calf operation. We've got about 80 head that we run up around in that Waukita area looking to expand that one this year. Um, I've been working, you know, talking to Shannon and Trent here. We're pretty excited about being able to partner up on having some more opportunities for our ag producers here in the county, some stuff that we have not done in the past. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an update on just some near future items that are coming up, and I'll go chronologically. So for my cow producers, um, January 28th is the Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association Winter Policy Meeting. I'm planning on attending that, and then January 30th, I'm going to have a bull selection and EPD workshop, um, probably about an hour long. It's going to be at 9 o'clock in the morning at the fairgrounds. Um, that one we're just going to work through, kind of, you know, Angus Association comes out with a lot of new traits that you sit there and you go through and you say, what the heck is this? So we're just going to do a quick work through on that one right before we get into breeding season and all these bull sales that are coming up. Um, switching back to the crop side of things, and that's what we're here for this morning. February 18th, we're going to do a Grant County Dicamba training. Um, we're really going to keep it just short and sweet and to the point on the Dicamba training. We're the gonna, required meeting? It's the required one, yes. Yes, the required training meeting. Yep. So we're going to do a serve a meal at 1130, and then we're going to get going pretty prompt at noon that day. So any questions that y'all ever have or any programming ideas that you want to talk about, get with me um i'll be more than happy to give you my cell phone number if you ever want to have a direct line to me um but we are have we, we just moved our office back into the courthouse this week so it's a little messier right now but if you stop in there um, but we are no longer here in palm creek we're back at the courthouse and so that's what we've got for an update right now awesome uh, also if you actively check your email, I'd be willing to bet Sarah's trying to build a little bit of an email list to send out to people yes. and tell them about dates. I will share it if you write your email on there. I won't put you on my one, I'll put you on Sarah's because we're in her county. So yeah. you know. we're sending out email updates and then if you are a Facebook user, we're gonna start utilizing that a little bit more to get some articles spread up and then um, just events that are going on. Gotcha, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, we did these last year, I say we, I, uh, did these last year in K County and uh, we had a whole lot of meetings like this where five, six people at each location went out to, around to the grain elevators and overall people really enjoyed it. We talked about building a grain marketing plan and one of my favorite questions I got that at the end of the program it turned into about a 20 minute discussion and he chose a little bit choicer of a word than heck. but. Uh, he said, what the heck is grain basis and how do I use it? And I said, I think I could probably talk for 15 minutes about that if we needed to. So we went ahead and decided to talk about grain basis today. Quick little show of hand, how many of y'all have actually done a basis only contract before? Cool, all right, so we're already a step ahead on that. Um, we'll go ahead and start with a little bit of a caveat that futures contracts are deliverable contracts. Uh, this is for Kansas City wheat here, you can deliver it at cost or at whatever the contracted price I'll is. Stop you there. Yeah. A couple years ago, I know people tried to deliver to the Wichita delivery point. Yep. When the basis was a dollar or something ten, and were turned down because you're not a member of the board of trade. Yep. So. So what's deliverable about a Kansas City wheat contract? Yep. So usually, and I, I think I got it on the next one. Why do people never deliver on them? And usually it's because they've got equity in it. 
they've got a cache and they just close out that position. They end up taking the cache and delivering it to wherever they want to on it. Now, if you've got an actual futures contract and your plan was to deliver it, I'd be pretty frustrated, but I believe you have to be a member of the Board of Trade or have someone who's a member of a Board of Trade to be able to deliver on that. Trent, do you have any? Yeah, I mean, you go back 100 years, we could deliver. The idea is that farmers should be able to deliver, but you deliver warehouse receipts nowadays. It's paper. And yeah, it seems, it's still a deliverable contract in the sense that contract and warehouse receipts still occur. Farmers being able to deliver, I would argue, no, you can't as a farmer. But it's not completely the same as like cash or live cattle or cash delivered or cash settled. There's no delivery on those contracts, you know. So you kind of you go back and forth on that, thinking about what makes it deliverable, what doesn't. The whole idea of deliverable contracts is the, you know, whenever the contract comes to delivery, futures price and the cash price should equal. And that wasn't occurring in that time you were talking about. It's why people wanted to deliver on them in Wichita. And some of that's been fixed, Dr. Anderson. I don't know how much you have any input on this but that's whenever they started going to variable uh, storage rates and the variable storage rates on the hard red winter wheat contract kind of fix some of that discrepancy between right. uh, the cash price and the futures price that delivery and fix some of that so probably less interest in delivering in the future because variable rate storage has been implemented it's very if you know how to take delivery on a grain contract uh, on the futures, if you can do that, there are people who would probably be willing to hire you and uh, work that system because there's a, there's chances to take advantage of some marketing opportunities there. I know that a few people did it uh, when I worked at uh, CGB in St. Louis. They would figure out how to take delivery on those futures contracts along the Illinois River and just the small part of that. Sometimes, too, those contracts just like anything on the futures market, someone has to take the other side of it. And that includes the delivery terms. So that's where you usually end up with a warehouse receipt to either go pick it up or you end up with a contract somewhere else to drop it off. Um, so actually delivering on the futures contract doesn't really happen a whole lot, but the equity you gain, the cost, that type of stuff does happen. There's extra transactions involved, but actually delivering on the futures contract doesn't happen very often. Yeah. yeah, and my comments on that, a lot of it is just uh, what I've heard from other people, of course. <laughs> if <laughs> people have any personal experience trying to do that, yeah. most of what I talk about comes from what my barn if you ever heard them talk about it. I'm just heavily there, there was a slide set over there. Okay. Thank you, sir. Because uh, he's been down that road, too, and personally trying to know. he was in the middle of that deal a couple, yeah. mm -hmm. three four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. they're, they're deliverable for the common farmer, probably not. Right. But for the context of this, there's a reason that there's differences in those markets. They, the, in these ones here, they have set numbers that they've got for those locations. But there should not be, it happens, like you said, in Wichita you had a dollar difference in what that was. But the market should converge on that. They are deliverable contracts. They should converge. Doesn't always, but it should. Uh, why didn't we talked about that? Why don't people deliver? Uh, most of us understand basic equals cash minus futures. It's the difference. Uh, but why the difference? And in anything, you can break it down real simple like that. And then we can talk about all those differences <laughs> that occur throughout the time. So we've got three main reasons. And uh, Dr. Borson at Oklahoma State University taught the grain marketing and futures classes. And he broke it down in time, space, and form. Time. A lot of us tend to understand that delivery window, grain's worth more later sometimes, uh, maybe it's worth less, it just depends on what's out there, but there's differences in time. Uh, space, where am I sending it to? These are the traits of that location only. Maybe they're next to a barge river, something you can load a barge on. Maybe they're uh, far away from this particular type of grain. Um, for example, in Oklahoma, we don't grow a lot of soft red wheat. Well. They're going to maybe have to pay up a little bit more to pull that in to do some milling type work if you're sending it to a mill. So there are reasons for those differences due to the space to where they are in proximity to other places. Uh, form, what are we using the grain for? How many of y'all ever fed some kind of rough wheat to cattle? Is it worth more than the stuff you're going to send to the elevator? 
Yeah, okay, <laughs> maybe right. Maybe during a couple of years ago when that market was up. But sure. yeah, <laughs> but exactly. Is it necessarily worth more? Uh, a lot of times, if you've got a feed value on it, probably not. But if it's that same quality, maybe. But it, 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 for, for what we're using it for, there's going to be a different price we pay for it. Um, I go into time. Uh, this is just the bids I pulled, I believe, early January for Marlin. Just like any bid sheet you see, there's differences in the basis due to time. Uh, that was a particularly good day. I think we've kind of trickled down just a little bit <laughs> on there. But used to, you could kind of bank on the basis being a little bit uh, lower during harvest. Um, still largely true, and that's simply because we've got an influx of new crop supply coming in. But we don't nearly have the seasonality we used to have. Uh, Kim, is it January and early February? Or mid-January to February is about the only time that wheat is not being harvested somewhere in the world. Correct. Cool. <laughs> he said that at the last meeting. I'm like, I'm going to throw that in the presentation. I'm going to sound smart. <laughs> but anyway, but for example, on soybeans, we've got January and February and July and August. And if you look at the seasonality of it, it's usually going to be a little bit higher during those time periods because they just don't have that new crop coming in. But it's a lot less than what it used to be. Used to, we were the powerhouse in producing all that stuff. Now we've got a lot much, a lot more larger growers coming into the market. Uh, those are the top four for soybeans right there, and I can guarantee you around the world there's other people growing it. Um, that is on your um, slide sets that y'all got out there as well if you're wanting to look at that more closely. Um, two will sometimes come into some transportation struggles, maybe during the winter that river freezes over. I, I know multiple times they told us we're not moving barges because we've got two inches of ice out on the river. Well, that tends to happen during the winter. So we might have, uh, might bid up a whole bunch when we see, uh, see a two week forecast and see a whole bunch of stuff like uh, a whole bunch of cold weather coming in that might be a week long. So there might be something to do with the weather or transportation struggles, uh, crop failure or poor quality or bad protein wheat. Um, I know some places will go out and bid like a bonus or a premium on top for good protein wheat. But if generally in the area, most everything was really good high protein. Well, why do we need to do that? We just get a higher basis bid out there and go buy all that stuff up. And sometimes people break it up a little bit differently. And then I've got storage availability. Um, I go back to maybe they can't ship it out for some reason. Maybe the roads are poor condition, or maybe they just uh, have such a chance to make a bunch of money on storing some grain. They're telling you, we don't want soybeans this year because we, frankly, we can't make enough money on it. We can make a whole lot more money on corn and wheat. So they may put that basis bid for soybeans way down there and let somebody else take care of that that year. It's all just in choosing what you want to do and how you want to make money. Differences in space. Uh, if you have not seen this website right here, those are on your slide sets. Uh, K-State Ag Manager does a wonderful weekly basis map update. And I love it. Um, anybody want to tell me why this is a little bit darker for corn down here? Cows. Cows. <laughs> Feeders. And then right over here, we've got the rivers. We even have a little bit of darker area right there for our Arkansas River out there because they've got a little bit of an advantage in transporting. And then we've got this area right here. Anybody know why it's real red there? There's a whole bunch of corn there. Nobody needs your corn there. They can find it under every rock out there. So there's differences in the space just simply wherever that place is bidden to buy it. Um, I go to uh, what type of shipping location it is. is it if you've got a rail loader that maybe has or a shuttle loader that's loading 220 cars uh, versus a truck house, they're charging a lot or they're get, getting their transportation a whole lot cheaper. Now granted they may have a little bit of troubles dealing with the railroad but um, they're not real fun to deal with but uh, they've got a comparative advantage there. Um, then the final one, uh, I've got, do they have cool hats? Because I'm going to deliver a load of grain if someone's got a cool hat, <laughs> if it's comparable. And then the, I'll do a little exercise at the end about competition. So I tried to find, I have no idea why this guy here is so dark. They must have really needed the grain for some reason. Because it looks like he's at least 25, 30 miles from the nearest place and nobody over on that way from them. So either that or maybe the guy just got lazy and didn't update the bid or something. Yeah, it's the early rail line up there. But got You'd think they'd have an advantage to, to do that and they wouldn't have a comparably high basis. So yeah, 
I, I don't know, but maybe they just didn't send the updated bids to this thing. So. I always find something interesting on these basis maps up here, something that just doesn't really line up. Who knows, maybe they had to have something, maybe it's a processor that has to have it, but it's always interesting to me to see the little oddities on this map. All right, and then the final one, form, we talked about that, uh, my personal favorite form right there. Um, but is the delivery location an endpoint? Uh, we'll talk about how basis is realized. Oh, we talked about how basis is realized because most of the stuff that we're sending to transport, to export out the Gulf is going over to Korea. Well, they're going to endpoints over there, and they don't have it. They're going to pay more up for it to be able to transport it. But we may have the mill up north. Are they an endpoint? Um, how much are they buying from you? Um, I had a farmer that used to kind of brag about a dairy farm nearby that would uh, buy a half load, 400 and 450 bushel of corn every day for five dollars back when corn was like 390 to 430, which is kind of what it is right about now somewhere. Uh, but they'd, they'd buy a load of it for five bucks. Well, if you're going to make me only deliver 500 bushel and it has to be every single morning because you don't have the storage, well, yeah, you better be paying me five bucks. That's pretty doggone inconvenient to me. So it, it depends on how much you're delivering, and then we go back to that quality of the grain. Um, I know the futures contracts specify what you're looking for, but we've got, you know, we need probably number one for that type of stuff. Number two, we might be using for some other stuff. Maybe we're um, not using it for human food consumption. All right, so how do I come up with grain basis? Uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, earlier, I worked in St. Louis as a grain merchandiser, did a little bit of trucking trading, uh, got my feet wet on basis trading and decided it wasn't for me. Um, <laughs> but how do we come up with basis? So we've got that first number there, that SIF, that's the bid down to the Gulf. That's how much they're going to pay us to deliver it down there. Then we've got our barge freight, um, I've got it for last half January delivery there just because that's when we're doing these meetings, but say it's going to cost us 24 cents a bushel to load that barge and send it down the river. Uh, all things uh, cost in that. When you're in St. Louis and you're buying upwards of 80 to 100 million just depending on how many uh, how big the crop is that year, you can actually make money at seven cents a bushel on the margin. But uh, it, it also gets even tighter than that because of how many facilities are at that location. But you simply do some real quick math. I'm gonna get paid that much, it's gonna cost me mu that much to get it there, and how much do I need to make off of this transaction? Now there's other way grain elevators make money. They might be doing some discounts, they might be doing some mix and blend, they might be holding and storing stuff, but overall they've got a guarantee that they're making enough money to at least cover their bottom line or their overhead and that's usually where that margin comes in. They've calculated a number that says we have to at least make this much so that we can continue operating. And we end up with a plus 26 against the March futures on that bid. And that is why you break it down to basis so that you can communicate real quick with these numbers here without having that grain market change every single second on you. Um, basis just doesn't move quite as fast. It's a little bit more phone, email kind of uh, conversation and communication. I'll go back again, uh, or we'll go out a little bit farther into country. Uh, Irvington, Illinois was uh, one of the country elevators that we worked with a whole lot. They're going to use our basis bid at St. Louis as their point that they're delivering to. We've got that plus 26. They're going to truck it I did 75 miles round trip times two divided by 850, came up with 17 cents truck freight. And they aren't processing nearly as much as us and they need a margin of about 15 cents. And that's how we end up, do the math real quick, end up with a negative six. A lot of us tend to understand that. We're just working back from all the delivery points. Um, I broke it down, elevator's gonna get paid something. It's gonna cost something to get it there. We have to make money while doing it. All right, the final one, we're not always bidding off of that delivery market. Um, what you'll usually see on that posted bid uh, is that delivery one, unless they're trying to get new buyers into the area. Um, I know that a couple of times we would bid the carry on the market. Uh, reason being maybe we weren't as competitive with our uh, barge loading bid, or we knew we were gonna carry that. So what I use in this example 
same numbers, but I didn't change that from Tulsa to St. Louis, I apologize. But we, we've got a 40 cent over bid there. Uh, this is also over the May futures. It's a different futures month and we'll talk about spread right down here. Truck freight's the same, margin's the same. So we've got to deliver, but we're going to take delivery from that farmer in January. Then we're going to then hold it ourselves until March and send it out there. So we're capturing that carry. But our current bid for January delivery, we can use those numbers and have a plus eight out there. We're going to work back with the cash because I always break it down to cash to kind of look at the carry. At the time, that January futures was 391 minus 6 because we're going back to that slide before us and we have 385. March is against the May futures because we've already passed over that, Jan or that uh, March uh, contract on the futures. And we've been, we end up got or we end up having a 398 and a plus 8 over the May. We've got 406. So we've got a 21 cent difference in cash price delivery to the, to, the, um, to the port. So if I'm an elevator, I'm not gonna deliver off of that, or I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bid off of that January delivery to get there. I've got 21 cents to work with. Maybe I can move a couple of my contracts that are already in January over to March and direct haul it and change, make a couple cents on trading there. Or maybe I can eat just a little bit into this and get a really nice comparative advantage and still be making an additional 15 cents a bushel and really process a whole lot of uh, grain coming through my facility. So you're not always bidding off of that nearby delivery market. Sometimes you're using the carry market. Sometimes we had one crazy one, which was really kind of funny. Uh, we had a hog feeder who was located right in the middle of corn country, bid for a bunch of corn, call us, and I guess they just didn't know the guy right down the road. And I called him and just told him to go there and made three or four cents on the transaction and stuff. So sometimes you're not bidding off of what you normally do. There's opportunities that come up in the market and that may change your bid a little bit. Yeah. All right, we're gonna do a quick little exercise and I am gonna need some participants. We had uh, Dr. Bailey Norwood used to do a competition. He teaches intro to Ag Econ. So uh, whose daughter was going into Ag Econ? She'll probably have Dr. Norwood for Intro to Ag Econ. He's cheery and a whole lot of fun, and uh, not to offend Kim, but he's probably my favorite teacher that I, I had there. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, Kim. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, I can believe that too. But uh, what he did at the beginning of every class to describe competition, and I've got to do seven of these meetings, so unfortunately you guys aren't going to make some real money today, but he'd have a $5 bill, four ones, and four quarters, and he'd have two people come up. One person was, in this instance, the grain elevator. The other was the farmer. So the grain elevator had to offer the farmer some amount of his $10 that he had, and the farmer had to accept. But if the farmer didn't accept, nobody made money. Basically, it's kind of the same thing here. If, 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 the, if the grain elevator doesn't buy grain, they're not going to make nothing. So with just one and one, what do you think happened most of the time? What, what would you bid to some, someone if they, if they knew you had $10? Start out low. Yeah. Start out yeah. kind of low? Yeah. What if you only had one chance? If you had to guarantee that they were going to accept it so that you could go home with something? Get it in the middle. Right in the middle, exactly. You only got one guy to deal with. You only got one guy to deal with in that instance. But, and and there, there, is, there is something to be said. We're going we're gonna to get a little bit farther into five buyers and you know, different type stuff here. But yeah. if there's only one guy to deal with and you've only got one chance, almost every time Dr. Norwood said it was right about 450, 550, somewhere right in there, right in the middle. Because if I don't get him to agree something, I get nothing. I get nothing. So that's, that, that's not a lot of competition, but there's at least still some kind of respect there. Now, what if he offered you eight bucks? Yeah, I'm on. Yeah. yeah, you'll take it right away. What if he offered you two? I look around, but you know, nobody look around. Yeah, but you don't got nobody look. Situation. It sits in the bin and stores. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the real world situation. What if they only offered you 50 cents? I'd cry. Real world. <laughs> You'd cry? Well, or... You might, if you know that he can't make anything off of you, you might go lose all your money. 
There's a value, I call it the up yours value. <laughs> um, there's a value in saying, I don't want to work with you. You're, you're, you're beating me up. So there is a value there. Um, we get into a, a five buyers and an unlimited amount of sellers. Now we're talking more about that like St. Louis market where there's seven elevators, two ethanol plants, all kinds of stuff going on where it's the buyers clamoring and competing. So competition is certainly important in these basis markets. Sometimes if you can't figure out one of those time, space, and form, I put competition under form, but it really I think should be its own bullet point. Sometimes if you can't figure it out for one of those reasons, it's just people being competitive, competitive and beating each other up <laughs> and wanting to make sure that they win. Let me go ahead and go to the next slide here. I, I, so I break it down to how can you guys use basis? Um, the first one, grain contracts. I think most of y'all raised your hand and said y'all have done a basis only contract. Anybody confused when they called you at the end of the, uh, the futures month and they said they had to roll it? <laughs> it's, a, it's a wash basically. You're getting charged just the transaction fee so don't feel like you're getting beat up on anything there. You're losing no position uh, on that day at least. But it, it sets the delivery month. You're still at the mercy of the futures contract. So it's, it's the same. It's not exactly the same as selling nothing but you've locked in all those basis traits and all you've got left is that futures contract out there. So you're still open on the market on that. And then I've got on there, you'll need to roll that futures to, it, it, so that you don't get that delivery that we can't do or we, we tried to do and they told us we couldn't or something like that. We've got to go ahead and move that or we've got to go ahead and take care of those uh, transactions there. Uh, what I like to do, or I say like to do, what I like to try to get guys to do is a little bit more of a risk management, maybe putting a put option against it, maybe doing, I know a lot of the elevators in the area, they do some risk management type contracts that can couple with that basis, and maybe you're guaranteed a floor price or something for a certain cost, or there's certain ways you can do that to uh, either offset the cost of that put and call or something, but you can lock in that level. Two, I know when we were, if we had a floor price on something, after you delivered that grain, we could pay you on the guaranteed price right away and get that cash flow going a little bit if it needed. And then the final one is just comparing, using that information to compare delivery lo locations. That map, you're not gonna see oddities very op often come up on that map, but sometimes nearby you're like, wow, that one's, that's a pretty good bid over there. We, we may need to try to take advantage of that or something. Also, when I, when I think of those locations, I, I use, and I'll, I'll throw their name under the bus, uh, uh, Center Ethanol, because they're not in business anymore, <laughs> probably for reasons. But in St. Louis, there's an ethanol plant. They only took hopper bottoms. You're just about guaranteed an hour and 15 minutes to wait to, to dump. And then sometimes they'd just go ahead and shut down and leave it too, because they, they filled all their tanks that they needed. And especially if you were two and a half hours away hauling in, Man, you want to make a trucker real mad or a farmer real mad, you just shut the place down. So consider the customer service provided, consider the time that it's going to take you to get out there, consider the effort. I mean, I don't make a ton of money, but you, you could just about tell me, you know, if it's only 10 bucks I'm going to make, I'd probably rather sit at home, you know, so don't clamor over it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a little diagram. Basically, if you think the basis is good, lock the basis in. If you like the futures price, lock the futures in. If they're both good, sell it. Kind of a simple little flow chart there, but I've got that at the end. That's all that I myself have today. I know that uh, Kim's going to get up here and tell us a little bit about a market update, or maybe Kim might just want to sit there. <laughs> but, uh, and then Trent's going to give us a little bit of a livestock update. But does anybody have any questions pertaining to basis or anything like that? Okay. Now, I'm a little different. Uh, I mean, basis and knowledge about the basis I think is important. It can give you an idea of uh, maybe when to pull the trigger. But in reality, selling wheat is easy. How many of you have heard a third and a third and a third? Yeah. And a third and a third and a third, in my opinion, worked. It was uh, give you a few cents over time, a little less than selling at harvest. But times have changed. The wheat market's changed. It's a different animal than it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago. 
and it's ch huh? Four or five. Or five, yeah. And I want to I want to talk about some of that. Uh, I'll just my philosophy: you don't need puts, you don't need calls. A forward contract, I think you can you can possibly use those from from time to time. But I think most of you just need to keep marketing and selling wheat simple. And I'll show you why. All right. The uh, exporters, this is hard wheat exporters. That's hard red winter and hard red spring wheat. I've got Australia in here. They've got uh, hard, hard white wheat and soft white, but I've got Australia in here. But for the exports, this is of world exports, United States, five-year average, 96 through 2000, was 25%, Argentina, 15%, Australia, 24%, Canada, 26 Kazakhstan, 6 Russia, 1 and Ukraine, 3 20 years ago, that's right. Now, 20 years ago, this is the monthly average Oklahoma wheat price from 1991 through 2000, 10 years. The yellow is, if you could predict price, that was the month to sell it in. That's the month, now, I took off four cents per month storage and interest cost. I started it on August 1, rather than July 1. Is that about right? Do I need to change that? Start storage? Yeah. Yeah, it starts. It'll start. When did it back then, though? Yeah. It won't change the numbers. I've already had Borson challenged it yesterday. <laughs> I went over it with Borson. So, if you'd have sold every, every year for 10 years, if you had sold in June, 321, 313, 307, 313, 321, 321, 319, a third, a third, and a third, right? Unless you can predict price. Now, this is the actual price received by producers minus, it does, you haven't taken out your storage and interest. And if you look at, at the month, if, you, if I'd have multiplied this all out, the month's percent wheat sold each month, uh, starting in here, you subtract out, uh, out about 10 cents per month. Or around 10 cents, you'd lower these about 10 cents if you looked at an average price. But the producers, 325, so it'd be about 315 if you took out storage and interest. And they got 321 if they'd have just sold in those months. So back 20 years ago, how should you sell your wheat unless you can predict price? In my opinion, just sell across the scales. If you like to, if you like to own, you know, fill, own it, and you know, like uh, th sell it at 307 and you lost three, or you sold it at 388 and you lost four. And this is after storage and interest is out, 378. Yeah. Do you, did you ever calculate the monthly variance of price? The spread in June, where price started and ended. If you want to complicate matters, yes, and have a look at it, yes. Is it relevant? No. Uh, just, because yeah, because sometimes you're going to sell high, sometimes you're going to sell low, and on the average, it averages out. Yeah. I was just thinking the, the average prices. If you had a lot of price movement, you set it up on a 30-day marketing marketing strategy where you sell some every day for the first month after storage. So if you enjoy doing that and you want to drive your elevator manager uh, crazy, do that or just pull the trigger. Dollar cost averaging. That's what, that's what I'm selling here. Okay. Right there. That's when to sell your wheat 20 years ago. What's happened? Well, the last five years, the U.S. 17 percent, Argentina, this is production, exporters production, so this is of hard wheat, U.S. 17 percent, 8 percent, 10, 14, Kazakhstan, 33 percent of all hard wheat produced 
in the world is Russia, 12 and 17. Add those up. What's, what's your percentage there that's produced in the Black Sea? 33 and 12 is, is 45 and 6 is 51 percent of all hard wheat in the world is produced by those three countries. Black Sea. What about exports? 14, 27, 41, and 6. 47% of all hard wheat exports is out of the Black Sea. Has that been increasing every year for the last five years? It started, it's, they start, it started in about two set, really the early 2000s, but the big increases have been since 2010 to 2012. In other words, 2010, 2012 to present is when that big increase, in other words, really the last 10 years. One thing to remember there too is they've got a, a rush for the Black Sea area's got a, a huge freight advantage to most of the export. Yeah, I've got, uh, I put that map in here, but we loaded the wrong one. I've got a, I've got a world map but that's okay. But you're right. The only place the United States has a transportation advantage in the market is Mexico. Now, we have, we're about equal if you're going into the uh, Southeast Asia, Pacific Rim countries, Indonesia, and those countries, right? Philippines, Japan. We're about even with the Black Sea right in there. Uh, they're delivering 12.5% protein. What's your protein? 11, Oklahoma averaged 11.4 last year. This morning, uh, ordinary to uh, 11.4 was 90 cents in Kansas City. 11.4 was 105, 12 is 140, 12 6, 173. So from uh, yours at 105 to, to uh, 73, about mm, 68 cents. Just protein. They've got you on. So it's changed. It's different. So now let's look at the last 10 years. I, I want to make a comment about that. This right here? No, about pro protein. Yes. So we see a lot of variances. Since we have a train loader, we see a lot of more of that information than we used to. Yeah. And an 11.5 coming out of the Black Sea is not the same as an 11.5 coming out of the Gulf. What's different? I can't admit it's not committed. So it's, there's some differences there. And, and the, market, the market knows that. Okay. Just an FYI. When you're, when you're looking at 11 fives coming out of the Black Sea, it's not the same protein as 11 fives coming out of the U.S. gold. They just measure it different. They measure it different. It, it's, I can't tell you what it is, but the market knows there is a difference. I've heard reasons too that sometimes the reason uh, an importer gets a direct relationship with some type of company out there is those barges that go out to the open market, they're not going to send those ones. They put them on the open market for a reason, and partially might, the reason might be that they're surprised that, oh, let them buy protein on that one? Well, yeah, we're going to send that one away and sell it for whatever market price is. They may have probed it in a certain spot, and they thought that's a little higher than what we thought it was going to be. It's better, doing better than that. We're going to send it out to the open market instead. That might be a small reason. Um, I know that happens in corn on the Mississippi River. Um, yeah. Anyway. I'm going to go ahead and. Oh, no, 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 you got a good point there. Um, and I've heard over the, especially if you go back 10 years, maybe even five and further back, that uh, yeah, they had 12 5 protein, but it was junk wheat. I read one deal this last year that uh, they've got more, they've got an IDK problem. Uh, so you may have 12 5 wheat with IDK. Uh, Egypt rejected some loads because they had excess IDK. However, 
the quality of the Black Sea wheat has improved dramatically. They put not millions, but billions of dollars in their infrastructure. And this year, uh, and I'll get to it in just a little bit, things are changing again. Well, I'm, well, let's remember that. Let's go through the impact of this change, and then let's talk about the, the, the next change that may be going on. Okay, so what's it done to, to how you should sell your wheat over the last 10 years? Well, it sure has increased June, July. In August, three out of 10, that was the best month. And before, right here, 1997, you could go back to 1970 and never, never was August the highest month to sell wheat in. It was before it or after it, but not August. And you look at this 10 years, three of them, you got, it's the highest average month of those three months. Now, realistically, you got to your variance, Trent. There is no statistical difference in these three prices because, I mean, you just sell a day and you, uh, Monday rather than Tuesday or Wednesday rather than Tuesday, and you've, you've changed that. But right here is where to sell your wheat. 541, 532, 526, 523. There's what farmers actually got. Now, why? Why would you store wheat into October, November, December? Only in 2010, and really this peak, you know, so I cut it off these one because I think you really need to sell before these one. This peaked at around seven dollars and something cents in April. But I didn't didn't put that out there. Why would you not sell your wheat at harvest? You can say, well, I can sell it and buy a put, but if prices are going down, is it the board or is it the basis? Should be the board. <clears throat> at least for it. Well, <laughs> in nineteen eighty eight I did a meeting in Alva right right at harvest and I was talking about buying puts and calls, selling and, and buying, the, buying the call. And uh, a group of about six produce, producers did that and had me back out in November. And the price of wheat had increased 42 cents that year. And 38 cents was in the basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they had me back out to have a piece of my hide. In my opinion, Oklahoma producers do not need to worry about puts and calls. Forward contracts, I think, are of some value. But in my opinion, given the market we're in right now, and given the, the produ level production around the world of wheat, why not just sell it and be done with it and spend your time on managing cost, inputs, maintaining equipment, and producing a quality product? I can also tell another story. I was down at uh, Altus. Oh, mercy, it's probably 30, 25, 30 years ago. Remember, did you remember Robbie Robbins? Oh, yeah. Well, it was Robbie. He was at the time chairman of the OSU Board of Regents, big cotton wheat farmer down in Jackson and surrounding counties. I did a meeting down there, and a white Ford pickup just scalding down the street, stopped in the middle of the block, backed up, came up that parking lot. I was talking to Mort Murray Williams. I don't know if you, he's the other big producer down there. Came screaming up, rolls down the window, and it's Robbie. He says, Kim, I lost $10,000 marking my wheat this year. How should I sell it? <laughs> I said, Robbie, sell it at harvest. You're south of I-40. Price it. Normally you get north of I-40. There you're nodding your head. It's fallen. You fill the pipeline with that. But just sell it at harvest. He says, Kim, it can't be that easy. 
I said, yeah, Robbie. I said, you're south of I-40. I said, do you look at the, the, the information? I also knew that he sold his cotton with the pool. So he, he keeps saying, I said, okay, Robbie, if you don't want to do that, just sell a third, a third, and a third. Sell a third now, a third, oh, September, October, the final third in, in November. And he says, you know, it can't be that easy. I said, Robbie, just do it. And he says, if it's that easy, what do we need you for? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I've, I, I, you know, I'm not as old in the tooth as I am now, and this is the chairman of the Board of Regents, and I'm going, <gasps> and Murray says, Robbie, you're going to listen to Kim for the next couple years, and then in three or four years, you're going to think that you can outsmart the, smart the market again. You need him here to remind you to follow this strategy. Right there. Anybody disagree? Well, it's not complicated enough. But once we go to the next 10 years, you said, we, yeah, we followed huh? your instructions 20 years ago. We, now we're losing money by hanging on to it. Okay. To, How to, is the market switching in the future? Okay, to answer that question, why, why, what caused this? Why did we go from this to this because this right here they start they start their harvest in mid July and it runs out through July August September and maybe into October this and this right here their exports caused this used to none of i mean we, uh, your last Argentina and Australia, their production ended essentially January one. They cleared the market, and the on, the next crop in the marketing year to hit exports was the U.S. crop. And of course, that's why. And you didn't have the competition coming in until late August, early September. And now they come in, and when they come in, also. Back over the past few years, they haven't had storage. And their farmers uh, had debt and tight cash flow. Now, my information says that over the, the last five years, they've made on the average about 50 cents a bushel. That's above total cost, not variable cost, total cost. And this year, the Russian, farmer. the Russian farmer, Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. Let me. Oh, I don't want to get to that yet. Okay. No. Okay. That, oh, that's the next. Oh, I could have went back and forth. Okay. That they've taken that, they've reduced debt, they've got their 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 cash. They don't need cash this year, and this year Russian exports are 15 to 20 percent behind last year's level. They're storing wheat. Why? Oh, this is some economist over there. <laughs> yeah. Or recently, the moon was falling. Because in the past, They've dumped it all in on the market right here, and it's driven down prices. And so they're st they can store it and level it out, and normally by, oh, February, maybe March, they've exported every bushel of wheat they've got to export. And then prices start coming up. They can store in and hold it for higher prices. They've built the facilities. They've built the cash reserves. And it's changed the, our marketing opportunities. They, do they have similar market to, that we do? I mean, the growers in, in the Black Sea area, I mean, do they? Yeah, they've got the demand. Later, and it's, uh, you know, a market. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I don't know either. 
but I, I stayed in the Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> From what I understand, uh, they're still building infrastructure, storage facilities. Uh, they, have, they have put, the, the major investments have been in their export facilities and the transportation to get it to export. They're now starting on their internal uh, facilities. So they're... It is a free trade system. Well, yeah, that you've got. Uh, what do they have over there? It used to just be the government bought it. All. Yeah. Now it's a little more over. And uh, you, well, you have uh, ADM. You have your big traders. You have your your big big traders there. Yeah, the internationals are all there. Okay. Now, here's uh, world wheat production, and now we're let's go back, keeping your mind. The change between 2000 and now, what's happened in the Black Sea area, that development, and I would say it's maturing. The question is, is can they continue to increase their wheat production? Uh, they possibly could, but I think they're bringing in uh, your, your uh, less productive acres. Um, I, they wanting to produce uh, other products, but anyway. Uh, you know, you almost got a linear increase here in production. Now, I'm a good economist, and you know, a good economist, what's two plus two? Depends. Huh? Depends. Well, if it's, a, if it's a mathematician, it's four. If it's a statistician, it's four with a variance of two. If it's an economist, they say, what do you want it to be? <laughs> From 70 to... Right about 90, you had uh, it, world production increased about 519 million bushels a year. From 90 to about 04, it was pretty much flat, minus 94 million bushels a year, and then 481 on up here. Why are our prices low? Right there. That is production, and that's consumption. So how are we going to get your prices higher? Well, we've got to get this leveled off. <clears throat> and I think that's happening some. We, uh, U.S. stocks are down. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't know how. I bet you I've got those on here, and I bet you they're hid. I bet you I put the wrong one on here. Well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, now, what is going to happen to your price? Now, go back to 2000. You know, what do we have right in here? Three bucks. Now, this is the Kansas City price. Uh, right here, you had some drought, some production problems. A little shift up. I call this the ethanol effect right here. A six, seven drought, low, tight stocks around the world. Uh, from right here up, doesn't count. Nobody had any wheat to sell. It's all spec. Actually, the speculators were selling out of the market, and your small specs were still buying in, and they got, they got crucified. But right now, we're right down in here. Now, when we had low prices, like they are now, you had low protein, low test weight, and excess stocks right in. This is 2016, 2017. You got low prices in 18. I've got another slide that shows you your protein in price. And, and so what, what's our problem here? Excess world stocks, poor quality wheat, protein, protein and test weight. So as a producer, what price should you expect? As you plant out, are you going to plant wheat? You're going to plant beans? You're going to plant cotton? You got to have price to figure out which one of those to plant, right? What price are you going to use for wheat? Now, this is really going to make you happy, I think. Uh, this University of Mo Missouri's Policy Center, uh, they projected out the next five uh, U.S. average annual price. And this is USDA's average annual price projected out. 
Oklahoma price normally runs 10 to 15 cents below that. I'll take it. <laughs> can, you, can you raise wheat? Let's say USDA is right. For five dollars and ten cents a bushel. So they would have to do that. <clears throat> it depends how you're using wheat. If the cover crop just to grow out there to plant soybeans into, you can grow for cheap. Yeah. Well, you're making your money off of beans, not wheat. So the wheat price doesn't count. If you're harvesting wheat, let me put it that way. If you're harvesting wheat, can you do it for five dollars and ten cents? If you can, do it. Or should the 375 <laughs> That came up at the meeting the other day. Somebody asked me, uh, what's the average cost to, per bushel, uh, to, what's the average cost to produce, per bushel to produce wheat for the 2000, for the 2020 crop? I like Trent's answer. He doesn't look at the per bushel because the per bushel cost is the total cost divided by the number of bushels. And, and production is more variable than price. I've had a standing bet my entire career with plant and soil scientists that I can get closer to uh, the uh, yield, I mean to price than, in June than they can the yield. Because I've done the research. There's more yield risk than price risk. Trent said... Travis, do you remember our budgets that the agronomy did on... No. Trent, that's your, that, that's your cue. I still leave it about 175, 180, depending on... Of course, I'm a high cost producer. Yeah. And I, I admit that. But. So he says, how much do I have to generate? And then if you look at price, $5, how many bushels do I have to have per acre at $5? Rather than the cost per bushel, it's cost per acre. And then what have I got to do? Okay. Now, we'll get into your basis here. Uh, recently... Uh, some black sea wheat, mostly Russian, was sold to uh, Egypt for uh, 232 uh, and 20 and change per metric ton. CNF Egypt. Uh, the freight was 1347. The uh, made a CNF into Egypt port 245.71. That's equivalent to 669 a bushel in the United States or in dollars, in bushels. If, uh, if we shipped wheat to Egypt out of Houston, it's about 78 cents a bushel, ocean freight and insurance. I got 20 in and out at Houston. I noticed you had 24 on your barge facility. A uh, $1.20 spread our margin from a Houston to Oklahoma that gets your uh, Oklahoma elevator price at 451 to compete. Where are you at today? About that. About that. The blasted market works. And also, Ken, it comes back to your protein deal. You know, our hard red winter wheat exports are 24% uh, above last year's level. Last year we had uh, 12, uh, 3, 12, 4 average protein. This year we got 11.4. With better exports, I've been saying that question of why are exports so strong? One, the blacks, Russia's not exporting wheat. They're holding back wheat. But I show this just to, to show you that the, the market works. Well, how long do you think Russia's going to hold their wheat? I don't know. Are they going to hold it where our high price <coughs> harvest and kill that? Oh, I don't have that in there. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I've got it. I do have this slide on here. Okay, we'll come back to that question. 
And I, I'll tell you what I think is going Why another reason I think things are going on the way they are. Okay, in the United States, <clears throat> our indie stocks down just a little bit. 46% uh, stocks to use ratio. And that is how much we, uh, our, our indie stocks divided by how much we used. And so we've got half, in other words, when we start next year's harvest, we got half our needs in the bin if you count that stuff that's under the tarp. I mean, anyway. It's harvested. It's harvested. Uh, you can go back to when prices were better, 25% uh, stocks to use ratio. Well, if you look at the Black Sea, here's their supply and demand deal. Uh, their ending stocks are 400, 404 million bushels out of a 4.2 billion bushel harvest. Now, if you look at U.S., we've got a 2 billion bushel harvest with 970 million. Stocks use ratio 46, stocks use, use ratio 10, Russia's is 8. Their stocks use, use ratio is 8%. That means they've got less than, but they got about 30 days supply of wheat when their harvest starts. If they have a crop failure, they don't have any cushion. And I think <clears throat> you read between the lines and there's, there's reports. I don't think uh, they want it out in the market. But the Russian government was trying to figure out how to build their stocks without restricting exports. I don't know how, but it appears they are. I think that they... They see this, and they've got to, they, they need more cushion than that just in case something happens. Remember 2010. What happened in 2010, at that point in time, Russia and Ukraine's uh, production was projected to be 3.1 billion. It came in at 2.1. That's when you got a $5.75 price increase from uh, late July to mid-February. And so you've got, you've got this going on here when this is what we look like. And if, you, and if you look at the world situation, the world situation is 55%, not counting the Black Sea, or counting the Black Sea in there. But don't, don't they export a higher percentage of their crop than we do? So they've got a little bit of cushion, they just stop. If they've had a total crop failure, well, they just stop exporting. Well, well, we used to sell 80% of Oklahoma wheat went to the Gulf, but now it's not here that high. Uh, yes, they do. Uh, we, we export about 50%. Still export 50% of the crop? Ours is a little less than that. Use a billion bushels low? Yeah, right in there. A little, we've been selling 900 and quarter to a billion, something like that. Uh, in there... They'll be probably 60%, maybe 70 I'm trying to think. I've got a slide hidden somewhere that's got the exports and, and the domestic consumption on there. But yes, they do. And so they just block exports. Just block exports. Uh. However, if you have a short crop, crop, what quality is it? Well, generally we use it. Yeah. Oh, and then Russia's of this, 63% is Russia, 25% 11. Kazakhstan, uh, I include them in the Black Sea, but Kazakhstan hasn't changed much over the last 20 years. The change has been in Ukraine and Russia. Okay, now my last thing to say about wheat is as everything I've shown you is smoke and mirrors except for that, right there. Everything else is smoke and mirrors. Everything is information that's nice to know. Why? Why? You want to know why this is happening? Well, that's why. But in my opinion, that's what you need right there. Now, can it change? Yes. What's going to make it change? 
Right there. Well, if the Russians are storing their wheat now, they're going to wait and unload that stuff just for harvest when our price is high. Is that going to change the whole picture? Yeah. Uh, possibly. Or are they going to extend exports rather than running out of wheat? In other words, if you've got a supplier, if you, if you want to, to be a supplier for flour mills or for countries, do you want to only be able to supply it seven months out of the year, or do you want to be able to meet their, their needs <coughs> year-round? And yes, it's going to impact that. So should we go back to third, third, and third, or just unload? Okay, I'm going to say no. Okay, so you've got this. And you've got this. Now, what's the, on both of these slides, this one and this one, what's the, what's the same in both of them? Selling June. Yeah. June is the same in both of them. Now, July and August are different, or August. And it's different out here. But what I think it's going to do, it's, it's just going to flatten this out. I think it's just going to flatten it out. It's going to reduce your variability in price. And if it flattens it out, now I've taken out five cents a month, storage and interest. So if, if you've got on farm storage, you can add that in here. It's not going to change anything. It would uh, on, uh, if you had on farm storage and you could manage your storage, it'd change this. That's what I was going to ask on this one. Uh, for 90, or 1990 through 2000, uh, Black Sea did not produce near as much, correct? And they didn't export hardly anything. Yeah, so we might see something similar. I mean, there's, what, what, what is it, 321 to 307 on that 10-year average between there. You probably yeah. see something similar to that. Yeah, but the difference. They're, not going, they're not going to, they're, I don't think they're going to lose any percentage of that market. If they're just going to spread it out more over the year. That's my guess. It, the change has just started. And so I don't, I can only guess, but economic theory tells me that it'll just flatten this out. And Borson said that. I had Borson going up over there. He, he was. He, you can get him going. Yeah. He's a fun he, he was. <laughs> he, he agreed with me on that. Yeah. And, and uh, they're in. And, uh, they, you know, he's got, he's got wheat land and so on and so forth. You haven't compared it to the spring months. Are you better off forward contracting in March, April when the corn's going nuts, planting, and as to wait till after weather? Like, you always, Southern Oklahoma always got a better bid at the end of May than we did the middle. If you're going to forward contract normally late March, early April, if you're just going to do it over time, it's the best time. I would like your, your basis contracts sometimes. Now, the problem with the basis right now is it could be more variable than, than uh, futures. I mean, when you talk about a, a, a dollar, minus dollar thirty uh, compared to a plus ten, and you probably had about both of those, you may, you may have only been to a minus buck ten. We've been there. Yeah. We've been both places. Yeah. Uh, right now you're offering. Yeah, but your forward contract basis is 30, 30 at minus 30, isn't it? It's minus 35, minus 30. Yeah. So sometimes if you're watching, and. Uh, Low protein last year, and if you've got protein this year, they're going to need it. You think his base is going to stay at a minus 30 if he needs, pro needs to buy that protein wheat? No, he's going to bid it up. You're going to have a higher basis because I think the market's going to want that protein wheat. Now, if you don't have protein, that's another story. So I wouldn't do a basis contract. But I'd look at what's in the market right now you know, what's causing that basis to be where it is right now. 
And what could happen, you, you have a low test weight, low protein, that base is going to be minus 50 because nobody's going to want that wheat. If you've got protein and test weight, they're going to want to buy it early and they're going to bid up that bid and they're going to do that with the basis. Does that, does that theory still hold water with all the protein premiums out right now? I mean, as far as protein being in basis? Uh, Yes, yes. In other words, yes, I've been saying that over the last few years. You say, I don't get a protein premium. I say, yeah, you do. If you look at the basis, look at it this year when you got protein versus the years you don't. Well, I'm saying that the protein premiums are pretty widespread anymore as far as those just being a, another premium or discount. Right. And at some point in time, we're going to run, and we've done it in the past where you've actually got an inverted protein premium. Because everybody, if... You have, say, three years in a row where you've got 12, 4 protein. Well, the mills need some lower protein. They really want to they really want to grind no 12 to 12, 12, 1. And so they need some low protein quality wheat. And you know, I've seen it not very often, but I've seen that invert. <laughs> we got a file. We can take it. <laughs> Still make money, so we'll file it, yeah. Officer Anderson, you're talking about those export as a percentage of production number. Russia was 63, Ukraine's 25, Kazakhstan's 11. For what? You said those percentage of production and exports. Oh, yeah. Okay. Did you find a... You sent me that yesterday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the one that I don't have up here. I couldn't pull up on email. You know. Before you start on the form. Yes. Um, I think... What we've seen, what you've seen over the last few years with June, July, August, yeah, is pricing. I, I think VSR has impacted that significantly. What's that? VS variable storage rate. Okay, yes. It has impacted that uh, significantly in the last few years. That's where you've seen since since we went to VSR, we knew we were going to have, and you had carry. You wanted to buy it. Everybody, every elevator yeah. wants to buy that harvest bush. Yes. To store it and capture the carry. So that that has enhanced your harvest base. Right. Significantly. Yeah. Since VSR. Yeah. Do you see Russia's crop change changing as the Russian farmer gets more affluent? Will they be switching over to beans? At their proximity to China. For some reason, my observation is, is Russia can, uh, they, okay, Russia and Ukraine, but mostly, most of Russia is North Dakota North equivalent, maybe half of South Dakota. And they, ju they just can't hardly raise beans. Corn, that's a possibility. Ukraine uh, and I'll, I can show you where, who, I can show you, well, I've got the changes over the, the last 20 years for Russian corn and Russian beans, if you want to see that. I don't think you're going to see much in beans. You could see a little bit in corn. Anybody else? I'm not a biologist. Yeah. <laughs> what, was your, what was your wheat production number, all-in number? Oh, it was uh, somewhere around 175, 180. Yeah, we're, we're, we were 171, so we're yeah. pretty much the same. Now I'm a young, expensive farmer. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, that was no, he's got to have a lot of money in there. Well, we, when we do those budgets, it's it's to raise as much wheat as we can. So it's high end. High end, yeah. Does that include overhead expense? Or most Depends. Of <laughs> yeah, a lot of my numbers usually use uh, customaries, so I don't put in a return to the farmer. I don't follow machinery cost as much on the total cost value because I'm figuring if I'm using an average custom rate that would pay someone to do it, it should pay for the person to run the equipment and to replace the equipment. Yeah. It's not a perfect number and it's usually high. Uh, that's where you'll see some people will come out with a number that's 150. You know, they might not have a return to the management number in there, and they probably are depreciating equipment pretty hard in those values. 